Hello, my name's Mr. Atherall. Um, I'm just going to talk through Act 5 of Macbeth, some key quotes, some key ideas, things you might want to think about in terms of the, the exam um, coming up. So let's start to race for it. There's, there's lots that goes on in Act 5. Um, so we start with the Doctor and Lady Macbeth. So Lady Macbeth, there's been a role reversal in terms of how she's coping and how Macbeth's coping. She was initially cold and emotionless and able to cope with murder. Now she's the exact opposite. She can't cope. She's, she's sleepwalking, mumbling about the guilt that she feels. Whereas Macbeth seems totally at ease now. He has killed so often that he's become cold-hearted and emotionless and, and just willing to take the lives of others. So Lady Macbeth, um, she says, uh, out damn spot. She's looking at her hands. She's desperate to get rid of the blood. There's no blood actually there. She's hallucinating. And she's desperate to get rid of the, the, the um, guilt that she fears. Desperate to rid herself of, of, of that. Um, hell is murky. She senses that's where she's going to go. Or that's kind of metaphorically where she already is in terms of her state of, what, of, of mind. Will these hands never be clean? Will I ever get rid of this guilty conscience? Well, probably not, is the answer to that question. The doctor recognises what's going on. Infected minds, that's how he describes it. Her mind has been infected by the evil she's done. There's a moral message in there that Shakespeare is delivering. delivering. If you mess with things in the way that Macbeths have messed with things, your mind will be infected. You will not be at ease. The, the suffering will be great and your, the mental suffering will be great. You will face the consequences of your actions. M Lady Macbeth, very, very different. If we think of it at the beginning of the play, I shame to wear a heart so white, she said to Macbeth. I shame to be so cowardly to feel like I can't handle this. Now she can't handle it. She's gone to the, to the, to the point that she described herself as, as, as not in. So that's Act 5, Scene 1. Act 5, scene 2, we've got Ang Angus and Lennox. We keep going back and forth, back and forth. The pace is building here as the attacking army who've come from England with Malcolm and Macduff are approaching the castle. So Angus um, talks about Macbeth. Just, just the way he talks about him is just an interesting and good quote to think about. He talks about his title, the title of king. Now does he feel his title hang loose? The, 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 the title of king is slipping from him about him, like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Great, great metaphor for him, a dwarfish thief. He's stolen the crown and he's not a big enough man to take it. The belittling of Macbeth, the way other people feel about him, he's just a thief and a dwarfish thief at that. Um, this job of being a king demands a giant and he, he doesn't fit, he doesn't fit this role because, because of the evil that he's committed. That's, that, that's, what's, that's what's wrong with him. Then we jump back to, to Macbeth, um, and he is um, got that arrogance. He's, none of woman born shall ever have power upon these. He's speaking about the witch's prophecies. He's still got that um, sense of invincibility. He has a chat with the doctor in this scene. Um, he, the doctor tells him what's going on with his wife, and he just responds with, cure her of that. Raise out the written troubles. So. His expectation is that you can just get rid of these, you know, emotions that she's feeling. The reality is, no chance. She is tormented by the evil she's done. You can't just get rid of that conscience. You can't just rid yourself of the, the things that you've done. There is an effect. The effect on Macbeth is that he's become cold-hearted and emotionless. The effect on Lady Macbeth is she's going mad with the guilt that she feels. And she can't just simply be cured. Imperative verbs at the beginning of those sentences, cure her of that, raise out. Just ordering emotions to change, an impossibility from Macbeth and Shakespeare has got a message in there. Someone just came to the door, I'll uh, continue after that slight distraction. Okay, um, Act 5, Scene 4. Um, again, back to the army, they're approaching, they're in Burnham Wood, they're chopping it down. That's how Burnham Wood is going to move to Dunsey Name. That's how one of the prophecies that the witches gave about he wouldn't be vanquished until that happens. They're chopping it down, they're carrying it there. That's how it's going to happen. So we've got some wood chopping down going on in Act 5, Scene 4. Then we come back to the castle again. Act 5, Scene 5. Here, Macbeth gets the news from Satan that the Queen, my lord, is dead. Satan, very, very interesting choice of name there, obviously making us think of Satan, the devil, and the evil that he is committing there. Opportunity to talk about religious context and how 
following Christianity was an important thing in the Jacobean era and Macbeth is going against that and obviously things are going to go wrong for him as a result of that. His cold, emotionless response is an interesting one. She should have died hereafter. You know, she would have died anyway. He does not care about his wife dying. And that shows how cut off from his emotions he is and how different he is from the beginning of, of, of this play. He treats everyone with a violence at this point. The messenger brings a message and he tells him that he's going to hang him on a tree if what he's told him is incorrect. Okay, Act 5, Scene 6. Back again to the battle. We're going back, forth, the tension's building. There's a deliberate structural um, energy to this, to this moment. Uh, Seward, we find the tyrant's power tonight. And off they go towards um, Macbeth's castle. Then young Seward uh, is confronted with Macbeth in Act 5, Scene 7. They have a fight and Macbeth wins. And he pronounces, thou wast born of woman. He's still got that arrogance. He was born of woman, therefore I could beat him easy. No one of woman born is ever going to defeat me. Act 5, Scene 8. We've got Macduff and Macbeth. Macduff is looking for Macbeth. Turn, hellhound, turn. Again, that hellish biblical language of hell, where Macbeth is from, hound, the dehumanising metaphor that he uses, because that is the kind of um, character he now is. That's the, they're the actions that he's done, those of an animal. Macbeth still got the arrogance. I bear a charmed life. You can't touch me. My life is protected by a charm. No one of woman born can kill me. But this is where Macduff reveals his, 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 his secret. He says, well, not, not secret, but something Macbeth didn't know. Despair thy charm. Macduff was from his mother's womb, untimely ripped, which is a fairly graphic way of saying that she had a caesarean. And suddenly Macbeth realises that he is in trouble. They fight. Macbeth dies. His the comeuppance has come to him. So, again... The idea of this being a cautionary tale. Don't mess with what God has put in place. James I, the king at the time, was loving this because he went to the throne and some people didn't think he should have been on the throne. Some people criticised that, that, that was he really the next person in line because there were some complications about that. The gunpowder plot had happened relatively recently in the last year or two from when Macbeth was first on the stage challenging authority, trying to take authority um, by force, which is exactly what Macbeth does. So this is kind of mirroring what happened in society at the time. So this is, don't, this is a, the, the message of this is don't mess. And it's a way of bringing context in. This was written for James I, and this is why Shakespeare made these things happen, because he wanted to discourage challenges to the throne, which James I would have appreciated. Act 5, scene 9. Last act of the play, we've got um, Malcolm Crown. Um, Macduff says, Hail King, talking to Malcolm. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head? He's carrying Macbeth's head on a pole. There it is, the usurper. To usurp something is to take what's, what's not rightly yours, to take it for yourself. That he is cursed. He was cursed. Mirrors again. He was cursed, maybe by the witches. That's, that's kind of what's being suggested there, his cursed head. And Malcolm, again, delivers a, a, a description of the Queen, this, sorry, of, of Macbeth, describes him as a dead butcher. A great, great line to describe the violence that he has committed upon human beings and his fiend-like Queen. Um, they're things that Malcolm says right at the end. So I hope, I hope all that's been really helpful. Lots of, um, lots of quotes to think about. Just encourage you, make a note of the quotes that there, think about what you'd say about language, think about, you know, if they're a metaphor, they're an oxymoron, they're, you know, an imperative verb, whatever device is used, think about how you name that device, talk about the effect, what ideas are within it, which words would you zoom on, and talk about their connotations of, that, that's how you want to prepare yourself, so that you're ready to go into the exam with loads of ideas, loads of quotes, that as soon as you see that question, you're thinking, right, there I go, there I go, there I go, I know where I'm going with this question. Good luck. Hope it goes well.